Today's class is offered to the general public by the BYU Family History Library. Our presenter is Elder James Tanner, who has a wonderful, extensive background in family history and genealogy research. If you haven't been to one of these classes, you will enjoy it. If you have, that's why you're back and we welcome you. So Elder Tanner, we'll turn the time over to you. Okay, well then I'll start sharing my screen and we'll be in business. Okay, I'm assuming everybody can see that, I hope. Yes, we can. Okay, um, today we're gonna talk about tips for working collaboratively on the Family Search family tree. And this may be slightly, I don't know, I don't think you're gonna call it controversial, but it's, uh, there's lots of opinions about what's going on on the family tree, and I'll try to address some of those. Um, I think that the first thing that you need to do is to understand what the family tree is, how it works, and why it works the way it works. The Family Search family tree is a cooperative public tree where participants can see how they connect each other, learn their lineage, and share what they know, what is known about their deceased relatives. So there's some, some key words in this statement. And this is uh, basically a, one copied from some of the stuff that Family Search has put out. But it's cooperative in the sense that uh, it's one tree, a unified tree. It's not your tree, it's not my tree, it's everyone's tree. And <clears throat> you can see all the dead people. And live people you can't see. So uh, you're going to see live unless somebody's still alive and they've been marked dead, in which case you've got to get corrected and mark them living again. But uh, the whole tree is viewable. So if you were to give me the, the name or I could identify one of your relatives, I could see all of your relatives as far back or as down until they turned into living people. So that's what, I, what we mean by cooperative. It means that uh, in a sense, and I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, everyone is in the same, on the same page. We're all doing the same thing. And it's public in the sense that there's no way to make your information. The living people are all private. Let's, let's make that very clear again. But it's a public tree in the sense everybody sees the same tree. There's no uh, part of it that's yours that nobody can see. And the answer to the question about, well, what if I want to do my own family tree and I don't want everybody on it and I don't want everybody to see it. And my answer back is always, why are you doing genealogy? Uh, what's the point? Uh, the point is to get relationships and have, and uh, understand who your relatives are and cooperate with your relatives. And so why would you want to make, make your tree private? But that's another discussion. Now, because we can do that, we have little apps that can come on the phones. For example, we have Around Me, uh, See My Relatives, uh, and other kinds of, uh, of apps that are out there. And there's one right on Family Search. If you go to the Family Search, uh, if you get the app on your, on your iPhone or you're on your Android phone, you can see, and everyone else has their phones on, the people that have your phones on, you can automatically tell if they're relatives, it'll tell you, show you how you're related. That's uh, based on the accuracy of the family tree. So if it goes back like 15 or 20 generations, it may not be exactly correct. Uh, and you may not really be related, but otherwise it's pretty interesting to see how many people you, are, you aren't or are related to. Um, and then there's part of this, it's called learning. And that's, that's the process that we go through to uh, put information into the family tree. We have to go out and find the records that uh, were historically created and uh, enter the same information from those records into the family tree. And then we also add sources, meaning we document the records that we've added. And then we share it. Well, we share it because we put it on the family tree. It's automatic. So that's what happens. So now if we go, um, and I would, and I'm making this statement quite literally, and I actually, I just added this after I had thought about this, uh, doing this presentation for quite a while. So 
<clears throat> and I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think of not most, if not all of your questions about the family search family tree as, as a project, as a an, uh, website or an, a program can be answered by collaboration. If you collaborate and you're willing to collaborate, then most of the questions that come up about the family tree are already answered. We don't have to, to go back and, and uh, worry about different things because we've already committed and know that, the, uh, that it's collaborative and that there are other people out there and that they're actually at different levels of understanding about how the family tree works and having what kind of information we're looking for. And so we just need to be real tolerant about that and understand that. So what you get as uh, for what I've heard maybe literally thousands of times now since the tree was introduced is the common complaint that the tree is that it, about the family tree is that other people can change the information that you enter. Okay. Yeah, that's true. You can, and uh, anyone could do it. Um, we have to rely on the knowledge, the expertise, and the um, and simply how well people can do things. I mean, people can make mistakes, and and the the, the question is this: uh, Why? What is genealogy? If we go back to this concept of genealogy, why are we doing genealogy? And and some of these basic issue questions. And those basic history questions address this question of, of whether or not there are other people. The other people who are um, working on that family tree uh, are not, uh, you know, there's lots of people out there, okay? You drive your car down the, down the freeway and you'll see lots of different ways of driving cars down freeways. And some of them are dangerous and some of them cause damage. It's the same problem here we've got to deal with the whole world's other people. And if you feel like genealogy doesn't deal with people and you don't want to interact, then maybe the family tree isn't the best place for you. But on the other hand, uh, the one great big advantage of the family tree is that it avoids duplication. And I'll talk and explain that a lot in, as we go along. Um, the family search family tree was designed to promote collaboration. The whole concept of the family tree is based on the idea of a wiki, like Wikipedia. And wikis have been around a long time online. Um, they were one of the first innovative things on the internet when the internet started to grow. And what they are, are collaborative websites where people can go in and make changes and add information and change the information that's there existing. And the rule that's, that's, that's happened here is that um, they all kind of drift, and you wanna look at it as a drift towards what is completely accurate and substantiated by historical references, by current history, whatever that it's being deal dealt with. And that is exactly, exactly what I have been seeing for the past year since the family tree was introduced is that it, it continues to get more accurate and it continues to get uh, past some of the, the big uh, kind of controversial people and things like that. And that over time, uh, all of the things, all of the problems with the family tree have been worked through. And I always say the same thing. I say, the family tree is not the problem. What the problem is, is all of the people and the data that they're putting into it. So as long as you recognize and separate the concept of the family tree being a very, very good program that works exactly like it's supposed to work and all the people putting things in, then you have to be tolerant of what of this problem that they, they talk about of things being changed constantly. And let me tell you something else is that if, we, if you follow through with some of the things I suggest today uh, and my experience and many, many other people's experience is that there are virtually no changes after a while in certain people. The changes move back in time or they move off to other groups of people or whatever it is. But that is a reflection of who's actually actively working on the tree. So, for example, this, this screenshot here is of my of some of my immediate ancestors. 
my uh, ancestors and my wife's at the bottom. But uh, some of these people used to change just constantly. Uh, the one in the middle there, Henry Martin Tanner, just changed and changed and changed. And yet, once we got all the documentation in, and we'll see some what's what I'm talking about by how many sources, then uh, the amount of changes that goes to Henry Martin Tanner today is negligible. Uh, one or two a year, maybe adding a source or maybe correcting a date or something like that. There's just nothing in there that's that's going to be making anybody difficult, having a difficult time. Um, there are major things that happen to, to the family tree. Um, one of those is caused by people uploading what's called a GEDCOM file into the family tree. That can cause sort of a ripple effect of a lot of, diff, a lot of, of uh, problems. Um, but this collaborative idea is a way to minimize that kind of impact. And if you feel like you're the only person out there, you know, the Lone Ranger doing it all by himself, then you probably are going to be really, really, really frustrated. But if you can, if you can enlist a number of your relatives, maybe nobody in your immediate family is happy or being doing genealogy, but if you understand that you're related out to hundreds, of thousands, and millions of people out there, and that basically you go out and find those people. And I'll come back to some of these um, ideas as we go along on, on what we're doing here with uh, the family tree. So remember, you're collaborating and you're collaborating once you get onto the family tree, meaning you're sharing the space, you're making and adding information that will be seen by everyone else who is related to you, who cares or wants to look at it. And even if you don't want to, I mean, even if you're, you're, you don't like the idea of sharing your information, it makes you nervous or you don't want to do all that. What's going to happen to all your work? You're going to die and it's going to disappear. And that's the ultimate issue that we have to face as genealogists. Unless you can put it into some format that will be preserved, then you're not gonna, it's not gonna be preserved. And I can assure you that uh, even if you make a surname book and you say, well, I'm gonna do my surname line and I'm gonna document all the, in my case, I'm gonna document all the tanners, even if it had already been done 10 times. And, uh, and that'll preserve all my information. Well, yeah, great. But you know how many other lines you have and you know how many other people you have by exponential? Two, time, two times two times two times two all going back. And there's tens of thousands by hundreds of thousands. And if you do the descendants, you've got tens of hundreds of thousands of people. And you say, well, I don't know who my parents are or I don't know who my grandparents are. And the answer is everybody has parents. Everybody has grandparents. And the fact that you don't know that is just another reason for using the family search family tree because someone else may know that information and that's that's kind of the idea here okay so regardless of how you view it everyone benefits from each person bring what they can offer to the family tree everybody has something out there that that is helpful about a person every has everyone has a different perspective my brothers and sisters my siblings each have a different story perspective our idea of our parents. And each of my parents, my mother and my father, each have a different life experience. And so that's what it is. This is a collective life experience. And my cousins may have a different view of my father than I do, or again, or of I have their of their father. And I may have some or none interaction with their family, part of their family. So all of this helps us to learn and understand each other as part of this great, great human, human family. Now, here's the key to the program. If you don't understand this particular key, then, then you may be very frustrated. And that is, you can follow any relative or ancestor. And if there's a change, and you can follow them if in the, the, the threshold that I give here is that it, if any change would cause you to be annoyed or frustrated, if you're just annoyed at, at changes, whether they're right or wrong or whatever, then you can follow people and see all of the changes that happen to that person. And once a week, Family Search will send you uh, 
a list of all the changes to all the people you're following. Now, I follow a little over 400 people. Um, I'd say that's un unmanageable for a lot of people. Uh, and I would suggest that you, uh, if you follow somebody and you're never getting any, any responses, I mean, week after week after week, nobody's making any changes, then you can add some more people to follow if you're worried. But if you, if you follow a few people and all of a sudden you're in the middle of a huge change storm where there's people are just changing and changing and changing, then that's a whole different circumstance. You're, you're, what you're doing there is you're jumping into what I call a fire swamp, uh, places where uh, the people are involved either do not agree on who or what's going on with these particular ancestors, or there are so many people involved that there was an, it's inevitable that you're going to have a bunch of people making changes constantly until you work through the whole mass of people that are related. And with people back in the 16, 1700s, that isn't going to happen for a long time. So if, you, if you're totally frustrated because your great, 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 great grandparents are getting changed at once a week or 10 times a week or something, or a hundred times a week in some cases, those, those people, they're called revolving door ancestors. And the revolving door ancestors are not, not going to go away real quick. Um, and that's one of the issues we have uh, that we're still talking about and that we have with, uh, and it's as a community, is coming up with ways to uh, uh, minimize those, that kind of, of circumstance. But the minimizing comes by jumping in and educating. And we'll talk about that. I will. So you're, you're notified weekly. Now, one thing that's happening, as you probably noticed already, is that I have blurred out the names of, of as, as much as I could of the people that are participating, just so they're not you know, worried about it. But you've got to understand that this is all public information. You, anyone could go in and see all of the stuff that I'm showing here. There's nothing I'm going to show that you couldn't look at if you wanted to go look at one of these people that are showing on the screenshot right now, you could look by their, for their name or you could look put their ID number, the KWC5GM7 that's on the first one up there for Amelia Jarvis and you would look at Amelia Jarvis. If you're related, great. Um, we kind of encourage everybody not to start messing around with other people's trees. In other words, the other part of the trees. If you're not related to these people and it's real easy to tell because every person on their profile page or their detail page has a link that says view my uh, relationship. And so you can just click on that and see how you're related. And if it comes up and says you're not related, you're not related by anything that's in the tree. And so don't work on it. Try to work on your own family. Don't work on just out random people out there. It, it doesn't make any sense because if you're not related to the people, you're not related, there's no way that you can actually cooperate. Now, what if you're working with somebody who doesn't know how to do the program or doesn't have the, is in the, is in the position of not being capable? I worked with one of my friends who passed away recently and uh, he, had, he did not have the computer skills. He did not have the ability, physical ability to get on and do research, but he wanted to help help on getting his family. So I helped him along getting, uh, working back on his family, several generations, actually about six generations. So that's possible. I don't mind that. And that's all part of the, the being cooperative and collaborative of helping others uh, with their, with their genealogy, but don't, uh, don't start getting into partisan fights in the middle of, uh, of, of helping people with their genealogy. And, and it's important to understand that, that even though a lot of the screen names that are in here are not necessarily identifiable, that we don't necessarily know who these people are because they don't give their, their names, that the, every change on the family tree is recorded and maintained. And you have a change log that is all changes. That means all changes. You can go back as far as the original, where the original information came from. And you'll see on this screenshot that there's a restore. And that button says, I don't agree with this change. And so all I have to do is click the restore and it puts in the 
the preceding information. Now, if you agree with that, there's no reason to restore it. It's just, you just let it, let it go. And, and that particular change continues. Now you'll see is that you go up in this, from the last entry down there about the Joseph City community tree, you'll see there's another one no, says also known as the Joseph City descendant community tree. And so there's either another uh, organization out there or um, in other words, there's some more information. So this is where you get collaboration. People, this you might know this much information, somebody else knows more, or you might know this part and they know this part. And when they get together in the family tree, all of that seems to make sense. And it's, um, it's you're able to proceed. Okay, so one thing you need to do is look at the names, uh, those who added the sources. Now, if they are using a screen name, that's fine. Those of us who are involved in doing uh, genealogy seriously over uh, extended periods of time uh, have decided that we are, uh, you know, we're going to be let, let people know who we are. And so if you go and find my changes and my information and my additions to the family tree and you click, you'll see that it says my name, James Tanner, and it'll tell you my email address and my telephone number and my address. And if you want to contact me, you are more than welcome to contact me. And so uh, you have a question or you have a comment or whatever you want to do. Now, uh, I think a lot of people in our society today are, are overly uh, hysterical about having people contact them. And uh, uh, I can tell you, I worked as a trial attorney for 39 years, and there was many years in there that we did not have listed phone numbers. We did not have listed addresses. It was not even something we wanted to have people show up at our house. So you may have a reason for being more private, but as a general rule, because this is a collaborative tree, it adds and helps people if they can talk to somebody. And a lot of the problems, and, and I'm just, I hope I say this enough times that people will get this ingrained in their heads that most of the problems of the tree can be resolved through collaboration. And that means communication between the people who are working on the tree. If you know that this, that what you have is, is supported by all these documents and we've been doing all this work, then you need to communicate that to the people who make the changes. And if they continue to make changes, even after you've communicated, then we have a different problem. But in a lot of cases, and, and I, there's egregious cases where people have just made changes and not ever responded and they keep changing and whatever. If they do that, there is an out. And that is that they can be basically blocked from family search, from the family search family tree by family search. But don't expect family search to do that until it is, it, you've exhausted your collaborative options. They're not trying to make this into a, a frozen, we're going to dictate who gets to change what kind of, of program. This is collaborative and uh, they're gonna let it collaborate for a long time before they uh, get to the point where they feel like that's not a good idea. And if we do find out that somebody is just, just doing like graffiti in the tree, in other words, just randomly changing stuff and making junk, then that's something that, that can be escalated and, uh, and stopped. Remember, these people are almost always your relatives. It's not just other people out there making the changes. They are related to you 99% of the time. And so, uh, you know, my grandmother used to say, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your relatives. And, and this, this boy, this is like the, mm -hmm. the example of that for sure. Uh, you are basically going to launch yourself out into working with your relatives. And that's the whole idea. That's the idea. The idea is to become involved. Right now, uh, we have uh, a, a sharing group on the family tree. Uh, of a uh, group of people that started on, on this family right here. Uh, that's Margaret Godfrey Jarvis Overson, uh, my great-grandmother. 
and the Jarvis family line. And right now there's a lot of people in there that are talking to each other and comparing stories. And, and uh, that's really the way this whole concept of the family tree should be working. And that's how and why it exists. Proverbs, the Bible, Proverbs 15 and one says, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Just think about that. If someone changes your, your grandmother's entry, you don't get on there and say, well, you blah, 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 I'm, you know, terrible person. What do you think you're trying to do? That's my grandmother. Maybe their grandmother too, by the way. And uh, they may have more different information than you have. And maybe you need to start thinking in terms of being kind and trying to educate people. So teach instead of complain. If you can't teach, don't complain. If you can't get bring yourself to try to help people to understand uh, your position and understand and be patient and kind, uh, just don't get involved because we need to have people who are not simply jumping in and defending their turf to the end of the world kind of thing. This is not a war. This is a collaborative uh, an enterprise that provides tremendous amount of information. And here's another one. Don't comment or complain or say, they're just changing my tree. They're changing my tree. And the answer is no. Well, what kind of sources do you have? Well, I don't have any sources. Well, then how do you know they're changing it? I mean, think about that. The only way you would know that your great grandmothers or whatever, or your, whoever it is, has been at the, uh, that the, the information has been changed or that it's now not correct as if you have the records to substantiate from valid contemporaneous sources that you can rely on that would that, to say that what they've put in is not correct. And then what do you do? Do you just fume about it and say, well, I'm not going to work with this family tree. It's too, it changes all the time. Well, okay. Uh, I'm not going to drive down the road because people drive other cars. Uh, it's, it's just not, it doesn't make any sense. And, and so what you do is what we do. And that is we communicate. We tell people, read the sources. Please read all the sources before you start making changes and do all those kinds of things that you need to do to keep this to be going. You can click on the name of the originator of any kind of change. Okay. So everybody that's in there, you can click on their name and you can send them a message directly through the website by email or call them on the phone if the number's listed, or if they don't have any contact information, you just you could send them a message right through Family Search that'll come out to them and pop up on their screen. Now, what if they don't answer it? Well, when has that ever happened? Yes, of course. But it does, but it's that's not the issue. The issue is you always have an avenue open in this program to communicate with others. And if they don't communicate, um, then patience, patiently, you correct what they do until they get tired and quit. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just the way we work with it. We just, it's kind of like a little bit of attrition. Uh, if they make a change and you change it back to the correct one and send them a note says, that says why you've made the change and then they change it again and then you do it again and send them another note and then you change it and you do send them another note. Eventually, either they get tired, but see, the answer to that is I don't ever get tired. I never quit. So as, as long as I'm alive, this will keep going. And so, you know, you just, you just have to understand that, that not everybody has the same perspective that you do. You may have, you may know that your grandmother is 105 years old and she's living in a care center or she's living with your sister or something. And you know that she's alive, but other people don't know that she's alive at 105 years old. And maybe if you communicate it with the people who made the changes in the family tree, you may very well end up uh, finding a relative who would be thrilled to be able to talk to your, to your grandmother or whoever else. So, or know that they're alive. So this is, this is, it's an educational thing. If you can't teach it, 
if you don't want to teach, then this isn't a venue for you. you you've got to learn to share and teach and, and help people with your information. Now, I, play, I blurred out all of the, the messages that I have, but this is the message form that comes up when you click up, up above with the little, uh, there's a little quote box up there at the top and it'll say, send a message. And then you can send a message to any user of the, of the family tree. And if they have an email or an, or an, an address or a telephone, you can use that. Because when they put that in, they're, they're agreeing that you can contact them. But even if they don't agree that you can contact them, they still have to be registered on the tree. They have to supply uh, their email, their contact information to Family Search, whether they let you know what it is. And Family Search then will send them the message through the system. And if they don't answer it, they don't answer it. I mean, you know, I don't answer all my mail. I get a, the only mail we get anymore is uh, about 90% junk mail, which doesn't have anything to do with us. And we fill our garbage cans and to haul them out every week. Okay. Now, what happens if you have the same questions coming up over and over again? Well, that's, that's simple. The collaboration part of it is to have some kind of standard response. And so over the years, we have... We, when I say we, I mean my family, my immediate family, those people around me who are closely related to me and my children and so forth are, are actively involved. And so what we have done is created some standard responses. And these are in a file on our computer. And so when somebody goes in and makes this certain kind of change, uh, particularly on this one back to uh, William Tanner in Rhode Island, then Basically, we don't have to think through the problem again. We don't have to get mad. We don't have to get frustrated. We just go in, we copy this, we send the message to them, and we make the change, and we change it back to the information. What happened? Where do we get the information? How do we know what's correct and what's not correct if there's a change? Well, if you think about that for very long, you'll figure out that you need to use a different program to as your whatever you want to call it, backup. And so you can put it on your desktop. You can use uh, Roots Magic or, or um, Ancestral Quest or uh, you know, any one of the programs that are desktop programs that are out there. You can use another online tree, uh, family search, I mean, uh, Ancestry, MyHeritage, uh, any place, any place where you can store the information and keep that information. So then if you, uh, you know, if they make uh, you, if they make you, uh, make the change, then you can get in there and you have the information and you just copy it back into the family tree. Uh, unfortunately, that happens fairly consistently, although I would say that if I compare the number of changes that I was trying to um, trying to handle maybe two or three years ago with what I am handling today, I would say there's been a dramatic drop in the number of actual uh, issues with cases that I, with people that I um, am involved with. And we're just going to see the people with the most changes are way back in time. What we're talking about is in, the, in this, it, it creates, it goes up, the, the possibility of there being a, a person that changes goes up as time goes back, as you go back in time. So if you're working in the 1800s, you may not ever see changes. If you're working in the, seven, in the 1700s, you may see a few changes. But if you're working in the 1600s, you may see changes constantly, just constantly. So it's just, and you could have changes with your parents. But if you're having changes with your parents, it's because you're not, you're not on the same page as with your with your siblings or with your other close relatives, first count, first cousins, aunts, uncles, cousins, peoples, and those are the ones that you need to educate and the need to be collaborative with and and learn to uh, learn to live with. If you have somebody just randomly who uh, you know follows the line down and ends up on your father and, and decides to change everything, then that's the same thing. You've still got to educate that person and say wait a minute, you've just come into the area where we have lots of documentation and we know what we're doing and, and whatever. And that may not be a happy situation for a while, but uh, 
you need to also remember to be kind, as I quoted from the from Proverbs, because the kind answer turns away wrath. If you explain very carefully what's been done and don't accuse people of being stupid or whatever, or don't use any kind of loaded words, then you're probably going to get along. And sometimes we just need to realize and admit that what we put in the family tree was incomplete or wrong. My grandmother knew everything. She was perfect. She had done her genealogy and she was the greatest person that ever walked the earth and doing genealogy. And the answer to that is no, they made a lot of mistakes back then. And the information they got was incomplete. And a lot of cases it was just not right. And so the fact that you have inherited a lot of information, you know, there's kind of two sides to this. There are people who walk into the family tree who do not know their parents. And so they have an open clean sheet. And by the time they go back a few generations, it's a very high possibility that they'll connect with somebody, but not always. But there are a lot of us who simply, and in my case, for example, over a hundred years of inherited genealogy. And uh, a lot of it was my own when I was doing it very early on. And I've been spent the rest of my life correcting what I did. So, you know, you just, it's the fact that my, my own genealogy was copied so many times, I could tell because they had the, mis the, the mistakes that I made in their genealogy. So that I knew they got it from me. And uh, that took me, and it's still going on, of taking years to get that kind of weeded out of the, out of the tree. It's a good analogy there, by the way. Um, if you had a garden and you planted it and uh, you watered it and came back in six weeks, what do you think you would find? Your garden or weeds? Well, it's the same with the family tree. If you come, come in and work on the family tree uh, and, and then you let it go for six months or a year and then you come back to it, you've got to understand this is a collaborative area and you may not find the same information or the same uh, conclusions made just because you've waited a long time or just like weeds you're going to have to spend a long time weeding your garden and cleaning up your tree if you uh, if you neglect it okay so the more people you can get involved with you on let's say on your side of the team the greater chance you have of getting your car going yeah well getting the information corrected and uh, making it reliable in the family tree. And one thing, one thing that's going to tell you what the what the chances are of uh, something happening if you make a change is to look at the number of people that are following and are contributing before making changes. Okay, so here's Henry Tanner again. And if you look up there, it says there's 15 people following him. And there are 71 past contributors. Every one of those, the following people, will all get a weekly notice of any change that has been made to Henry Tanner. And those people who are following are probably interested enough to come back and explain to you why you shouldn't have made the change or say thank you for making the change because that was good information. But the 71 past contributors tells you the, the interest level in this particular person and you're not going to see numbers that high very often, but on some of your ancestors, you will. And if you do see numbers that high or higher, then you can, you can guess that if you start getting in there and making changes, that somebody out there is going to come back at you and try to tell you why those changes, or they'll just change it back and won't even, and then you'll get to have to wait for you to get a notice. So that's kind of the way it works. Okay, so... Don't change any, any information. This, if this was some, I, I wish this was some way of making this uh, mandatory, but uh, you know, the less things you have mandatory, the more cooperation you can have. So don't change any information until you have read all the sources, all the sources attached. Look at the number of sources here, 180. Yes, you read through all 180 sources and figure out what you want to change. So that's, that's the way this story goes. So you just, it's if, and that's really what we tell people over and over and over again. Every time we get a change that changes some thing that's substantiated by the record, by the, by the historical sources, we basically say, go read the sources. 
this this source right here tells you that this information you've entered is not correct. And so it's it's an educational process. If you tell the person enough times that they shouldn't be changing information unless they have a contemporary source that uh, supports what they're entering, then eventually they'll stop because they don't have the source. But if they continue to continue, like I said, there are situations where we call it abuse. But don't believe that abuse is just simply because somebody changes your, your information. That isn't an abuse. That's the, that's the part of the program that works. Okay, so where do you go? What if you want to talk uh, and find out who all these people are? Well, there's community out there. And it's up under the little um, icons at the top that says question and a question mark. And when you click, you can go out to the community and you'll see in the community that there are, um, this is the community. You'll see all sorts of things. The 1950 census project, you'll see uh, family search help, uh, ideas and groups. And uh, you'll be able to see different categories of, of how many thousands of people are involved in asking these questions. So if you have questions, you can go here to the community and you will undoubtedly find a group of people who have exactly the same question. And, and, and I can assure you that these are all being um, monitored and, mo and uh, by family search. And uh, generally speaking, it's possible that you would get uh, a direct uh, response. But if you're just buying into one of the ongoing discussions, then you, bet, then you need to, like I said, this is a teaching situation and it's also a learning situation. So you need to read through the whole uh, list of, of comments and you may have your answers there. It may be that that is simply some part of the family tree that yet has yet to be addressed uh, in a way that makes it, uh, that people feel like it should be. And that may be correct and it may be a reflection of lack of resources or it may be just a, a question that they're asking the wrong question and they're discussing the wrong issues. The tree is not going to go away and it is not dead, but it will evolve and it has been evolving and it, and it'll repeat it again. It is not the problem. The problem is the data and the people to some extent. So <clears throat> here's, the, here's the whole issue. The whole issue here is to ask questions. And they're, the, the one kind of question that I seldom encourage anybody to ask is why, okay? A why question is always open-ended and always difficult to answer. And the answers are seldom satisfactory to the person asking the why question. You don't ask, and this is historical research. So you don't, it, it's not a matter of why, it's how, where, when, it's all the other questions that you ask. So let's say for instance, you have some information about your ancestor. Let's call it the great, great, great grandmother or somebody or grandfather. And you know from your sources that this person was born in a certain place. Let's say we're born in New York. And then someone else goes in and changes it and says that they were born in Massachusetts. Okay, so the question, what do you ask? Well, first of all, you say, well, wonder where they got that information and whether or not that's valid and whether my information is valid. So before you even start to get involved with that, you need to go back through your information of what you have already put in the family tree in the way of sources to see whether or not the information concerning where this person was born has been entered as a source. Is there a source that says, this is the question, is there a source that substantiates the change from New York to Massachusetts? In other words, some record that says this ancestor was born in Massachusetts, not in New York. Okay, so you go through all your sources and you find out that there's nothing in there that says anything about where the person was born. So then the next question is, is where did you get the information to say New York? And you say, well, it's in my mother's diary and the diary's right here on the desk and, and that's what it says. Well, why isn't that source and the copy of that page or whatever it is put in at the family tree? Maybe there would not have been a change had you put that in there and said, 
when you put in the source that says the person was born in New York, that it came from my mother's diary and here the diary page is attached as memory. And so then they have basically the answer to the question. I mean, they've, it's, you know, you've asked the question of yourself and then you've supplied the answer. And that in sense answers the question of where the person was born, at least until someone else comes along with a different record that may have more validity and more history-based information than, uh, than one that does, than yours that doesn't. Maybe your diary, mother's diary was wrong. And when somebody comes along and shows that this person was christened in a church in New York and it's the right person, all of a sudden that's a different, I mean, in Massachusetts, then it's not New York. Okay, so these are the questions that you ask. You always ask questions before you go jumping in and, and uh, worrying about whether it's who's right and who's wrong. And I'm right, you're wrong. I know it's true because I got this from my grandmother. Well, that's not, that doesn't help. That is not an answer to any questions. Okay, so now we can, if we do another part of this, there's a whole other part to the family tree and that's the memories part. And if you share your memories and what you know, uh, add what you know to other people's memories, that's two, there's two processes here. One process is to look in here and say, oh, look, wow, there's a, there's a picture of my grandfather's uh, football team. The answer is, yeah, but, oh, that's, that's so-and-so and that's so-and-so. The answer is you, you add that information to the family tree. You go in there to the memory section and you tag that person and you tell, and you tag them to the person in the tree. And then you add the information that you know about that person. That's how we collaborate. That's how we, how we accumulate more and more information. And yes, that is a picture of me when I was two months old. And you could tell by that where I, why I'm here today. No, <laughs> anyway. Um, so basically this is, this is the other aspect of it. And when you put in memories and you put in uh, pictures and documents and uh, stories, and all of the things that go into the memories, that information helps to bolster and, and support the information that is in the facts and the profile page, the, the detail page, and uh, in the uh, sources. And yes, you make a source out of, out of the memory. If a memory is a document, it can also be a source. So those are the kinds of things that help to, to alleviate any of the questions or issues that go on. Okay, so additional records, documentation, and artifacts increase the breadth of the family story. That's, that's sort of the way uh, the collaboration is about sharing. If you have an old uh, uh, whatever, uh, some kind of artifact that you got from your great grandmother, a sampler or a, a doily or whatever it is that you have, take a picture of it. Get your camera out, get your smartphone out, take a picture of it and share it on memories and tell where you got it, what it is and why it's there. And then that'll help other people have a, a, a connection with that, with that particular relative. And it's by doing that, that also helps solidify in a sense, the family tree. It's not just that Henry Tanner has a whole bunch of of sources, but it's also, he has a whole bunch of memories and documents and photos. And so he becomes a real person. And it's not, a, it's, it's much more difficult to, to change the information when there's a lot of documentation than there is that when, it, when there is no documentation. And, and I'm venturing to say that most of the so-called, that I've called revolving door ancestors would uh, come under the category of people ignoring the information that's available or uh, coming up with or not having any information at all. So remember, it's a public collaborative online tree and public collaborative online trees like FamilySearch provide the following benefits. These are what, this is why you have this type of tree. It reduces duplication, okay. My great grandmother, who did a tremendous amount of genealogy, genealogical re research, and I, through a long story, happened to inherit all of that. 
and enter it into the computer, discovered that she had basically done her entire genealogy three times. Because when it was on paper, she had no way of remembering how much information she had or where it was. And so she just duplicated all the work three times. I have three separate entries that she made of all the people. Anyway, but it also duplicates and keeps me from doing the work when you have the documents of me finding the documents that you have and you entering that information with a copy of the documents keeps me from having to do that same work. So it avoids duplication. It divides the labor, it makes it easier. In other words, more people working on it, the same family tree, the same individuals, we get a lot more photos, we get a lot more stories, we get a lot more information, we find more documents, and the total amount of information in the family tree just keeps expanding. And that information becomes more and more reliable over time. Even if you don't believe that, it is true. It does become more reliable over time. And I've watched that happen over the last few years. And it converges towards accuracy. I'm going to say it again. It gets more accurate over time, just because of the nature of the, of the item. And then there's the preservation aspect. And I mentioned that, that if you have your own family tree on, uh, on another website, for example, on, um, I'm not downgrading any of the other websites. They're all, a lot of them are really have tremendous uh, resources. But if you keep your private family tree on another website, like Ancestry, for example, what's gonna happen when you pass on? Do you know what happens to family tree on Ancestry when you die? And do you know who can get access to that information? Well, those are all questions that you might want to ask about any place where you're storing your information. I've got too many stories over the years of people's piles of, of uh, records and family group records being thrown in the trash by their heirs that uh, when they die. So it's, it's just a whole idea of being able to preserve. And I can assure you that family search is going to spend what it takes to preserve the information that they acquire. So here's the admonition. Take time to learn how to survive in the online collaborative environment of the family search family tree. Don't just get mad. Don't just get frustrated. Don't just say, oh, I'm gonna not going to deal in it with the family tree. But get, take the time and the effort to understand what is actually going on with the family tree, how it's working, and that it actually works. And if you are just simply dismissing it because somebody didn't like it or you don't like it or somebody you changed, somebody changed your grandmother and you're not going to sit around and put up with that kind of stuff, then uh, you don't, you're not listening because what it says, what happens is that the family tree is the, the, the repository. It is the place where you can go to see how much information has been co collected about any particular individual. And it grows and it's growing rapidly. And the number of sources are going in by the millions every year. And so the information is just, is just overwhelmingly large. And once you get it into it and you understand how it works, um, there's some work involved. And you may spend more time than you want to correcting information at first. But over time, those corrections um, diminish. And that doesn't always happen when you get to the 1600s because there's just too many people out there and too many people being born and coming online, you might say, to, uh, to really get a connection there. Okay, well, thanks for watching. And... Okay, Elder Tanner, there's a couple of our questions and a comment in the... Okay. Yeah. One is... Is it true that living people should not be tagged in memories as they are not private? Okay, the memories are not private in the sense that, um, that people who are marked and tagged are able to be viewed and, and identified by anyone who looks at the memories, that's true. The memories are also searchable by Google, as is most of what's on the Family Search website, except living people. If you have a person like you have your, your cousin standing with her uncle who died 
and you mark the uncle as tagged, then that living person is going to be visible. That's just the way it is because they're going to, somebody's going to be able to see the, um, the record. So the answer is tagging them to living people is, uh, is something that you want to evaluate and decide whether you want to do. Now, one way to do that is to put all the, all the photos on uh, and, and, and upload it, but not tag. And then what happens? Well, that's a good question. But it's just, a th it, you know, the problem you have is this constant con idea of what's private and what's not private. And um, I'm not sure that, that uh, you know, after the years I spent as being a lawyer, that my opinion about privacy would be well received. Of, because I just don't think that we have what you think is private is not. And putting a picture up on family tree, if, if somebody doesn't like it, they can complain to family search and family search will block it. If you, if, even if they don't come to you and say, why did you put that up? You can take it down. So, you know, it's just, it's kind of like the copyright issue. It's something that uh, changes with the circumstances every time you look at it. Sorry. Okay, the next question, is there any way to keep memories private? No. No, this is public tree. If you don't want it read, don't put it on. If the, person's, if the person's living and you put a, a, a memory or something on there, no one can view it. You're the only one that can view it. No matter what, you, if you put on anything on a living person, create a living person or whatever, no one sees that but you until that person dies. And then when that person dies, what's on there and what, what's been posted would be viewable to the public. But um, meanwhile, if it's private, have another website. I mean, do a, we'll put it in another program and save it and then put it on when the people die. Okay, and then the last one, the last one is just a comment. Wish the event date box could be filled in when the source is attached. The event date left column allows events to be sorted chronologically. I've avoided correcting or completing the event date box on submitting sources when I notice how many people are following an individual, felt it wasn't worth stirring up that kind of attention. Yeah. Well, there's lots of things that it's a living, the, the family search is a living uh, type of, of organ, the thing. It's, it basically changes over time. And those kinds are the suggestions that, that you can get in and get into discussions about. And I can assure you that there are people who spend an inordinately large amount of time um, discussing those kinds of questions and uh, and evaluating what how they would want to implement those, and if we do want to implement them, and and they've got to be conservative because you know how many people go kind of well the trees changed I don't understand anything I've lost everything you know that's the kind of attitude that you've got to kind of deal with when you're trying to change this program over time, and it's be, it's been evolving and it's it's um, it's far better than it was when it started. And it'll probably be much better in a couple of years or next year or the two years or a few years down the road. But uh, if you do have a suggestion like that, go into the memory and in, into the uh, communities and uh, either start a new suggestion or um, uh, basically if it becomes something that a lot of people think is a very good idea, uh, you'll find out that over time they, they get implemented. What else? Anything? What else? A couple of more questions. Are the living private if you share a helper ID? Yes. In answer to that, yes. If you're yes. using a helper ID yes. with somebody, okay. yes, they're private. So what happens, what happens every time you start it? If you put in a living person, it's private, and that ID number is unique to that living person. If someone else enters the same living person, they get a different ID number. So no ID numbers duplicated. And yes, when the person dies, you have well, however many duplicates that there are out there, and they're still addressing that over time. Question had to do with helper IDs. Yeah. What? And then what? the last one, can a person complete the event date box at the same time the source is posted? Yeah. Yeah, it's right there in the form. 
you just fill in the whole thing. In fact, right now, it'll prompt you and say, do you want to enter a date? So, yeah, well, the helper, so the question dealt with the helper box number. Yeah, well, the helper number, um, the one that, the number that's put into the helper is arbitrary. That's a number you put in. Your helper number is just a number. You can put in any number you want. But once you supply that to a person, they have to have that number to get to get in. If you change it, then that person went, then nobody will get in again, whoever's helping you. So. so. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Okay. Thanks, okay. Dr. Tanner. Appreciate